Welcome, and thank you so much for tuning in to this month's Ocean Climate Solutions Innovation Exchange webinar. Um, this is our second webinar in our Young series, and I'm so excited today to delve into an industry that I think we all participate in and we all benefit from, um, but whose role in climate change mitigation and innovation definitely deserves more attention. And that is the world of shipping and specifically um, green shipping corridors, which I see as a really exciting advancement in ocean climate solutions. So my name is Liliana Bastian. I'm program officer with the Ocean Visions UN Decade Collaborative Center for Ocean Climate Solutions. And I'd like to briefly introduce our center and the innovation exchange before we get started with our speakers. Okay, um, so the center is a UN Decade endorsed partnership between Ocean Visions, Georgia Aquarium, and um, Georgia Tech. And we have the understanding that the ocean's role in climate change mitigation is under addressed in research, in policy, and in innovation. And with that premise, we coordinate multi-sector, global, and regional efforts to identify and advance ocean-based solutions to climate change. Our innovation exchange is an ongoing series of online and in-person events, just like this one, um, that raise international awareness of emerging ocean climate solutions, profile different innovations to a global audience, and share common challenges and opportunities that are really meant to create connections in the space and um, build the network around ocean climate solutions globally. So thank you so much for being here today. And then before I introduce the speakers, I'd like to highlight that this webinar will be recorded and posted on Ocean Vision's YouTube channel. And then in terms of the structure, um, we're gonna hear from our three speakers working across sectors in shipping who will each give 12 minute talks. And then after that, we'll pose any technical and cross cutting questions to speakers in the remaining time. Um, so please put your questions in the chat throughout the webinar. And Courtney McGeechy, who is the center's director, will be collating those, um, which we'll then pose to speakers at the end, just so we can have a Q&A that's informative and also efficient. And so with that, um, we're hosting three individuals today whose work is making huge strides in ocean-based carbon emissions reduction and innovation. All three of these speakers um, work in governance or technical areas of shipping, and they each bring a unique perspective and approach to the components of green shipping corridors and how they together um, can help reduce the emissions of this really important and ubiquitous global industry. So our speakers today are Kirk Walt, Director of Business Development for Clean Energy Transition at the American Bureau of Shipping, Selena Elmer, Senior Program Manager of the Shipping Decarbonization Initiative at the Aspen Institute's Energy and Environment Program, and Di Gilpin, Founder and CEO of Smart Green Shipping. Um, so we will start with Kirk, and Kirk, you can go ahead and share your screen and take it away. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, let me get my screen up. All right. Can you see my screen? Yep. All right. Got it. Great. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited to be to be joining this this discussion, and I, I look forward to subsequent questions as we go along. And all right, we'll, we'll get started. And again, my name is Kirk Waltz. I work for American Bureau of Shipping, focused on clean energy transition opportunities for the maritime industry. And we're going to talk about green shipping corridors. Let's see, if let's get this working. There we go. First off, I just I wanted to um, give an overview of what green shipping corridors are. Uh, they were announced in November of 2021 at the in Glasgow at the uh, it's called the Clyde Bank Declaration at COP26, where the UK kind of made a promise of developing six green shipping corridors by 2050, which includes you know zero emissions shipping routes end to end by then. Uh, and of course, the United States followed suit by making their own declaration through the Department of State as well, with the same pursuit of a net zero emissions target by 2050. And 
this actually is a is not terribly old image of the announced green shipping corridors. However, new green shipping corridors are being announced very, very frequently, and this total number is growing. So there's a lot of global ambition to meet those global targets of zero emission shipping routes uh, between international or domestic uh, stakeholders. However, um, it's complicated and there's a lot of great information out there for, for anyone who wants to get more technical information or more summaries of all the green ship, shipping corridors being announced. Um, I like to just kind of share where good resources are on this subject um, before going into some of the technical details of how how ABS sees developing green shipping corridors moving forward. Um, the Mission Innovation website is a great resource for anyone who is looking to get more information. Uh, they have animated green shipping corridor routes that have been announced. They also have a, a tremendous library of resources that have been published by industry um, and other out, um, advocacy groups that, would, that are very interested in supporting these green shipping corridor efforts. And it's, a, it's very it's robust, I'd say, to say the least. And ABS actually has a few publications on that website as well that we have published, and they are free on our website. And I'd be happy to share them if anyone's interested after this discussion as well. So this is kind of the, the hardest part of a green shipping corridor. What exactly is a green shipping corridor? Um, you know, what is green? What is a corridor? And those are one of the biggest challenges that ABS has faced in developing a few of these that we are working on, um, I'd have to actually make kind of a compliment to an organization that we're very involved with and our founders of called the Blue Sky Maritime Coalition, who we are kind of working under their global outreach um, from a collaborator perspective as a means of really facilitating and developing these green shipping corridor opportunities through this a massive and vast stakeholder group that participates in their organization. And ABS is a global organization as well, which is very helpful. And to define what is green and what is a corridor, it really depends on how you define and, and scope the green shipping corridor that you are pursuing or you're involved with. That means who are, all the collaborators that you're working with, is it a port to port green shipping corridor? Is it a regional green shipping corridor? Um, one example, we are working on a Gulf of Mexico green shipping corridor where we are purely a domestic opportunity development where we're looking at finding ways to decarbonize shipping industries from Port of Houston, Port of New Orleans, and up to Memphis, Tennessee through intercoastal waterways and inland waters. So it, it really is <laughs> a very wide and varying means of defining what a green shipping corridor can be. However, the process of developing it needs to be very is, needs to be taken very seriously, and have some very critical building blocks to you know build the foundation off of. You know, understanding what the demand of a of a green commodity is between these two ports or two countries is important. Aligning and standardizing policy and regulations between those international partners or even domestic partners is critical as well. Um, also, understanding what are the viable zero emission fuel pathways, or is it preferred that a zero emission commodity wants to be transported instead of the fuel? Uh, we've also seen a lot of interest in a very pragmatic approach to developing green shipping corridors where it may be looking at a current commodity that's flowing between international partners or industry, and then those um, energy energy producers or shipping industry um, owner operators are trying to find ways to operate more efficiently with a long-term strategy of reaching a zero emission target. So there's a lot of ways this can be developed or it can be you know, finding new markets for green ammonia to be transported around the globe or liquid hydrogen as an alternative fuel source. So it, there are a lot of different ways it can be defined and a lot of different ways they can be developed. And we like to point out just the importance of really getting those defined boundaries and scopes understood with all the core partners and stakeholders within that system boundary to really understand how and what is going to be accomplished and what goals can be achieved in it. And it, it's complicated. However, it, I am a big proponent of green shipping corridors as a development and a convening strategy. And it's a, it's very exciting. And as mentioned, uh, that Liliana mentioned, the, the, the ubiquity of the shipping industry, and we'll, there'll be some other statistics in other presentations, but I like to point out how overlapping 
the maritime industry is to just about every other opportunity that is being published and, and uh, solicited from government agencies in support of green initiatives. The maritime industry touches just about every scope three emission on planet Earth. So it's, a, it's an important aspect to a lot of these. And there's a lot of growing interest and growing opportunity to get maritime involved in a lot of these different um, opportunities. And it's, it's an exciting time. But this also makes it very challenging. So ABS is actually working on developing a decision support tool for green shipping corridors, which I have a little animation for you all to see. I think I still have, I have a couple minutes of this perfect time. It's only a couple minute little presentation. However, our interest in developing a simulation model for green shipping corridors is focused on trying to facilitate all the complicated details and, and aggregate the complicated details in a way that that stakeholders can see their efforts in real time or in future state of what their green shipping corridor can look like. This is just a very simple model of six vessels going between Rotterdam and Singapore, as an example. Um, and some are on varying fuel types. And I guess the benefit of American Bureau of Shipping participating is that we bring actual shipping data to a simulation model. It's not just a simple animation tool. We're actually aggregating all vessel specific GIS data of their route in order to actually show real life uh, shipping efficiencies and, and em emissions reductions and consumption of different alternative fuels as well. To the benefit of vessel owner operators who would be collaborating in this green shipping corridor. Also, we have added port side infrastructure simulation as well in order to have a port to port an end-to-end -end model that can be used for decision port decision support for the ports as well, because that's where a lot of this is very complicated, even more than just the shipping industry, is the port infrastructure that's required for these to be successful in the long term as well. I'm sorry this animation is very fast. However, um, one thing I do like to point out is that we have this support tool that aggregates all operations of a port side infrastructure of moving containers, of bunkering fuel, of energy consumption on the shore side of, of the operation. And this is a simplified version. However, it, you know, in order to do these properly, they have to have a lot of information, a lot of critical details of uh, understanding consumption rates and where the value is to the industry or to the port themselves, understanding kind of where they're where they're going to be saving money or generating revenue from a new commodity or just having total cost of ownership information to understand kind of the economic value of, of this development. And as I mentioned, these things can get even more complicated. So ABS has you know, kind of built this model to make it as, as complicated as possible with the long-term goal of it being, a, a, eventually being a, a digital twin is kind of the long-term detailed goal of these things. And, and again, it's, a, it, it's a, a very fun and exciting time to be developing these and the, again, the biggest challenge is just getting all the right stakeholders involved to really be interested and engaged in contributing data to facilitate these long-term strategy um, activities. And just to, to kind of end this uh, again, I did want to mention, you know, ABS does have some really well well-written publications on this subject. And it's a it's a really interesting and exciting time to be participating in green shipping corridors. And the benefit of being on a on a presentation like this is that all stakeholders that would have some vested interest in in decarbonizing of maritime industry, whether it's a commodity being carried on a vessel or it's a community that's near a port, uh, it touches just about everyone on planet Earth. So it's a it, it's an exciting time to be participating, and I look forward to questions. And I I I hope. There are questions directly to me because I would love to get people involved if I can help do so as well. Great, Kirk, thank you so much. Um, that was really, really interesting. I definitely share your perspective on how important the maritime industry is um, in decarbonization. And yeah, I appreciate those models. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to our next speaker who is Selena Elmer. Senior Program Manager of the Shipping Decarbonization Initiative 
at the Aspen Institute's Energy and Environment Program. So Selena, feel free to take over screen sharing. All right. I think I have taken the baton. Can folks Perfect. see my screen? Yes. Right. All right, good morning or good afternoon. I'm on the West Coast, so it's still morning for me, but good afternoon to those of you who are on the East Coast. Uh, I'm really happy to be with you today and looking forward to sharing a little bit about the Aspen Institute's work on uh, our shipping decarbonization initiative and how we see green shipping corridors as really an essential component of expediting the transition to zero emission shipping in the industry. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Aspen Institute, we're a global nonpartisan nonprofit organization engaged in a wide variety of policy programs on a of quite a range of topics, <laughs> uh, but that includes our energy and environment program, which is where our shipping decarbonization work lives. And so building on some of that framing that Kirk, uh, Kirk included in his, in his remarks, this just a little bit um, of how Aspen sees this issue and how we got engaged. Really the maritime sector is vital to our way of life and serves as the backbone of global trade, moving goods all around the world. And if you look around the room that you're sitting in right now, it's very likely that the vast majority of the items you see were at some point transported on an ocean going vessel. But maritime shipping really has a greenhouse gas problem, producing about 3% of global emissions, which is equal to that of a G7 country like Germany or Japan, and is projected to continue rising in the coming years if we don't take quick action. And so the way that we are engaged in this space is that we know that solutions to decarbonizing shipping, shipping exist in the marketplace, but really the barriers to adopting them and scaling them fundamentally boil down to cost. Who is going to pay and who is going to bear the risk? And at Aspen, we see the challenges of getting new zero emission fuels to scale really as twofold. One side being lack of industry confidence in the demand for zero emission fuels, and on the other side, lack of supportive policies to make zero emission shipping competitive with fossil shipping. And so we recognize the role that public facing companies with ambitious greenhouse gas reduction targets and climate conscious consumers who are willing to pay a premium for green products and services can really have a unique role in helping address these challenges. And so our work at Aspen uh, is largely focused on uh, an initiative that we launched in 2021 called Cargo Owners for Zero Emission Vessels, which is a flexible and nimble network of cargo owners focused specifically on the challenge and opportunity of being a public facing customer of the maritime industry. And our work is organized around providing companies with concrete opportunities to reduce their scope three emissions associated with their ocean freight. And so we're really focused on the immediate deployment of long term zero emission solutions. And I'll talk a little bit about what we mean by that in a moment, uh, it's specifically in the container shipping sector. And, you know, car climate leading cargo owners see the writing on the wall. They know that the decarbonization transition is coming and they really have a vested interest in helping ensure that that transition is smooth to avoid price shocks and disruption to supply chains. They've learned some very challenging lessons during the pandemic. Uh, and, and some of them are really willing to act as first movers and put money on the table in order to make this happen in a way that works for, for their um, business case. And so, uh, oh, sorry, skipping too, too quickly. Um, just to get into a little bit more about our work and how we see connections to green shipping corridors, unlike our friends at ABS, we are not directly convening any green shipping corridors, but we are really keeping our finger on the pulse as these corridor projects develop and looking for different ways to connect our other bodies of work to green shipping corridor efforts as they emerge, and specifically looking for ways to engage the cargo owners that we work with. And so, I'll just do a, a very quick overview of our a couple of our bodies of work and how we see those connections forming um, with sort of the overarching context that we see two major levers that cargo owners can pull to help achieve zero emission solutions. One, uh, de a demand lever, and the other is a policy lever. And in many ways, we see green shipping corridors as the place where these two critical elements really come together and can be applied in practice. And so, with that uh, background, just a couple of quick overview of some of our work in this space. Sort of the, the first demand signal that cargo owners we work with can pull is to sign our 2040 ambition statement, which is um, in which they commit to using only zero emission ocean freight services by 2040. Currently, we have 19 cargo owners of various sizes, some very big ones, Amazon, Target, you can see some of those logos on here, um, some smaller regional cargo owners um, have signed. 
And just, this is a, a, just very quick, this is sort of the lowest barrier to entry to engaging in our work, but cargo owners don't necessarily have to have signed this ambition statement to work on our other initiatives, but we'll just keep raising this flag. It's a good way to um, demonstrate that cargo owners are serious about decarbonizing the maritime freight. Uh, the next uh, demand lever that we're engaged with, which is currently taking a lot of our team's focus and energy, is the Zero Emission Maritime Buyers Alliance, which we launched in March of this year. And it's a first of its kind um, demand aggregation mechanism, which is providing a concrete way for companies to reduce their scope three emissions through a forward procurement process for zero emission shipping services. And so what that means in practice is that in the next, actually next month, Zemba is gonna issue a request for proposals in the marketplace for a, a green premium uh, to move a specific volume of freight, our target is a couple hundred thousand TEU, um, with zero emission fuels on which various shipping lines will bid and whichever bid that meets the criteria for zero emission fuels, various specifications at the lowest cost will win. And then those zero emission services will hit the water in 2025 for a three-year commitment. And really the philosophy behind Zemba is that uh, if cargo owners come together to make a sufficiently large advanced multi-year market commitment for zero emission shipping early in the zero emission transition, those, those shipping lines carriers will then enter into zero emission fuel offtake agreements, invest in new zero emission capable vessels or retrofit their existing vessels, work with ports and other actors along the value chain that Kirk was mentioning who are involved, many involved in green shipping quarter efforts to ensure that the, the zero emission supply chain is ready for business and enable the concept of green shipping quarters to really be achieved in practice. And in terms of specific connections between Zemba and green shipping corridors, the first round of Zemba is gonna be geography neutral. And so it will use a book and claim approach and the green premium may not necessarily be linked to the physical movement of cargo, but we are open to consortium bids and it's likely that the carrier who wins the RFP, RFP may actually be moving that freight on a green shipping corridor because those um, initiatives are creating the enabling conditions for zero emission shipping to happen uh, quickly. That's sort of the whole point of green shipping corridors. And so we see that there can be, uh, Zemba can create a little bit of a race to the top amongst those corridor initiatives to, to bid for that uh, committed demand. And then in the future, we're planning to repeat this process um, likely annually. So it may be that in the future, Zemba could commit specific demand to individual geographies or even individual fuel types. So that's another potential connection point in the future. Uh, our next body of work is really focused on policy engagement and robust policy support and regulatory action at the global, regional, domestic and local levels is essential to make sure that the zero emission fuel transition uh, proceeds in line with the Paris Agreement. And so we, our work is really focused on um, engaging cargo owners to help amplify critical calls to action in crucial policy spaces. We've thus far focused at the International Maritime Organization, which is the global regulator of shipping, and at the United States um, for those companies that we work with that are based here. And we're really looking for opportunities to translate some of the lessons learned from our work, um, including Zemba, to help offer policymakers data-driven evidence to inform those regulatory measures to help continue to close the price gap between zero emission shipping and um, fossil shipping. And as our policy work evolves, we're gonna to continue to uh, harness those cargo owner voices and leverage our relationships and Aspen's role as a nonpartisan uh, convener to help uh, present a balanced view on issues and broaden the base of support for zero emission solutions. And um, in terms of green shipping corridor connections to our policy work, as these corridors develop from planning into operation stages, they'll really be a testing ground to show how effective current incentives and regulatory measures are in practice in the specific geographies where corridors are operating. And so if there are gaps identified, cargo owners and others engaged across the value chain can help apply pressure and send signals to policymakers about what measures are further needed to help drive that change. And then getting more specifically into our work on green shipping corridors beyond those other two um, major levers. Uh, Kirk mentioned there are many definitions and structures to green shipping corridors out there. We second that there are you know, over 30 have been announced and no two are organized exactly the same. Um, we tend to like this definition on the slide here that the Global Maritime Forum has developed, which is to define green shipping corridors as specific shipping routes where the technological, economic, and regulatory feasibility of the operation of zero emission ships is catalyzed by a combination of public and private actions. It's a mouthful, but we think it um, 
really nicely captures sort of the spirit of green shipping corridors. And this, you know, since being announced at the Clyde Bank Declaration in, at Glasgow, as Kirk was mentioning, there's been a lot of momentum on this concept and it's continually evolving. Um, but one thing that's important to note is that there are no green shipping corridors currently operating. They're all still in sort of feasibility and implementation planning. And so we see real value in um, having cargo owners get engaged at these early stages to help ensure that the way that they're being structured and set up works for their business case, because we know that cargo owners are ultimately are going to have to bear some of the cost for this transition early on. Um, and we see enormous potential in the in the, the way that green shipping orders can help test and establish the viability of zero emission shipping in specific geographies without sacrificing scale. And some of the tools like what Kirk was, was showing um, are essential to making sure that these products do, pro projects do move from those planning phases into actual implementation. There's a lot to wrangle um, and it's very important to make sure that um, the data are, are well collated and that everyone across the value chain is aligned around the specific goals that the corridors need to set. And so um, in that vein, as I mentioned, we're not specifically convening any green shipping quarters, but we are uh, in close contact with many of the institutions that are playing that sort of central uh, facilitator role. And so we have identified a couple um, sort of through lines in the corridors that we've been tracking and, and engaging with that we think can sort of help drive success in these initiatives and make sure that they're aligned with cargo owner interests. And so I'll just close by sharing a few of those ideas and happy to, happy to dive in more in questions. But first, we are really interested in making sure that green shipping corridors are really seeking a path to scale true zero emission fuels. And so to us, when we say zero emission, what we mean is fuels that have a zero greenhouse gas emission on a life cycle basis. So from, we call that um, well to tank, sorry, well to wake, uh, and are sufficiently scalable to decarbonize the entire shipping industry and for which things like safety and land use concerns have been addressed. And so for example, for us, liquefied natural gas doesn't meet these criteria. And so we really think the path to zero emission is via hydrogen derived fuels. And we are therefore supportive of green shipping quarters that are really looking at those long-term scalable zero emission pathways, not just what's available right now. Uh, we also are interested in seeing corridors look at blending gr the green premium with policy options, um, because as you know, as I've mentioned, climate leading cargo owners recognize that in the short term, as first movers, they're going to have to pay a green premium and help kickstart the market, um, and that's what Zemba is designed to do, but that voluntary first mover action is not going to be enough to bridge the cost gap. And so corridors need to look at a balance between public and private investment to um, enable these corridors to be viable. Many cargo owners are also very interested in the development of transparency and emission reductions and um, alignment across various players in that regard. So, you know, fundamentally what, what cargo owners want is to move their freight on zero emission ships. Um, but in the short term, as the market is scaling up and as fuels are being are added to the market, they recognize that um, booking claim systems that enable decoupling investment in zero emission shipping from actual freight movement are going to be needed so that that zero emission shipping can be deployed at, in the places where it's most economically viable to start. Um, but to do that, there need to be credible systems in place to ensure that cargo owners who are paying for that service can, um, can claim that benefit uh, in a way that's reliable and um, transferable and rigorous. And so um, corridors need to be thinking about what fuel assurance methodology are they using and you know, having um, robust book and claim methodology to start as they're getting set up. And then the last couple of pieces here, um, just having high ambition, the window for, for first movers to act is very short, especially if they're intending to inform the IMO's midterm greenhouse gas reduction measures, which will be set in 2025 and enter into force in 2027 or 2028. And so seeking specific and time bound commitments from quarter participants, like a specific number of zero emission vessels operating on a specific fuel by a specific year are really important to create a helpful foundation uh, to move from that planning to implementation phase and keeping a Paris aligned decarbonization trajectory within reach. And finally, since there are so many corridors operating in this space and moving so quickly, we really see value in them sharing lessons learned with each other and ensuring that, you know, as corridors are making discoveries, and I think the tool Kirk referenced is a great example of how that can that data can be shared across initiatives to make sure that there's not duplication of effort since different corridors and different geographies are grappling with 
the same versions of, of the same challenges. Um, there's a way to kind of gain some efficiencies and benefit from each other's learnings. So I know that was a lot and I probably talked very quickly. So I will uh, stop there, but happy to answer any questions um, once we get through the presentations. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Selena. Um, yeah, we have a lot of questions coming in the chat, so I look forward to this Q and A. Um, meanwhile, our final speaker is going to be bringing the innovation perspective on all of this. Um, so, Di Gilpin, founder and CEO of Smart Green Shipping. Um, Di, feel free to share your screen. Awesome. Cool. So really exciting to have um, been following Kurt and Selena. Really terrific presentations. Thank you all. Thank you very much for inviting me. I will probably speak as fast or faster than you, Selena, because there is a lot to get through. So um, I just wanted to begin by talking um, a little bit about uh, who I am and what I'm doing and why I'm here. And basically, I'm an innovator. I've worked in Formula One, I've worked in uh, motor racing, yacht racing, I was on the launch team for cellular technology, um, and basically saw a gap in the market for combining some of the technologies that we've had um, in racing into, into the global maritime segment. And, you know, this is the greatest race on earth that we're all embarking on now. And so we should be inv in invoking this mindset that I think the previous speakers have, have exemplified, that we've got to move fast. We're not just talking about this, we've actually got to do something. So in 2014, I launched Smart Green Shipping um, and we're about wind assist in global shipping. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But I also advise um, the UK Department for Transport, the EU and some um, green NGOs that are looking at how shipping impacts their market. So that's just by way of an introduction to me, but I'm I'm, I'm an, an innovator and we're driving a very, very fast and nimble small organization, an SME, a, a, a startup. So just to the point about global shipping, Selena amply described how much um, greenhouse gas emission was being produced by global shipping. And I think one of the other layers, and, and Kurt talked about the complexity, I think one of the other layers that we need to think about is that the, the global shipping is not just container ships. There are multiple other sorts of ships, bulker ships. Um, so what solution there are, and there are a multiplicity of different technical solutions that can be um, engaged with on different ship types. So the, the COZEV coalition is working tremendously well on the container side of vessels, but I think we need to be also focusing on the bulkers, the, the, the tankers and the bulkers that can use different technologies. And the one that we are proposing is wind. But we think that it's really important to start thinking about wind because we need to be, look, we need to be moving very much faster. The IPCC, Paris, have all said that we need to be moving faster than we than we are. So what we're looking at with wind is it's a, a much closer to market solution and it reduces emissions in line with that with climate scientists' um, prediction of how close we need to be to drive down emissions in the very short term. So what smart green shipping is about is data-driven wind power solutions for global shipping. And the reason that we're focusing on wind is that in it, this is this is to set to be absolutely clear this is wind working with some sort of power some sort of engine which is powered by fuel i'm not saying that this is an exclusive solution this has to work in parallel with everything else that's going on and i think we need to be demonstrating that we can have a sort of hybrid solution for shipping in the way that we we we, we started transitioning automotive industry so what we're able to do by applying wind assist solutions to existing bulkers and tankers is reduce emissions and reduce cost of fuel, whether that be a fossil fuel or whether that be a green fuel. And I think there's something rather um, useful to understand about the, 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 the use of, primar of primary renewable energy to provide direct thrust to a ship rather than using primary renewable energy like wind to convert it into another fuel. I think we need to do both things, but we should do them. Um, we, should, we should have a kind of low hanging fruit where if you can use wind on your ship, you should use that to reduce your overall fuel requirements. 
And so to the point about green corridors, until relatively recently, all corridors were green and that global shipping has been built on wind. And for 8,000 years, we were able to do uh, just that. Everything was moved by, by green fuel. So the Clyde Bank Declaration has thus far been very fuel centric. And what I want to um, make the case for today in this, this forum is that we should be thinking about the other part of um, the, the, Clyde Blank the Clyde Bank Declaration that talked about fully decarbonized fuels or propulsion technologies. So since COP26, we've seen little work done in green corridors around the propulsion technologies part of this conversation. And so I think it's important that we start to, you know, and I take on board, there's a lot of complexity here, and we're just adding some more complexity by saying, and there's this other bit of solution that we can come, come to, to think about, but it is a really important one. Um, I, I, one of the things I want to, to, to highlight is that I was at COP26 and announced smart green shipping support from the Scottish government for a solution um, the, the, the method was called Seek and Solve, to develop our fast rig technology. Now, just to give you a little flavour of what that is, um, we have, um, I can't seem to make the animation work, which is a bit disappointing. Oh, here it is, look. Um, so these are retractable, robust, fully automated wing sails that need no further um, input from the crew then the, the, the master obviously has an override. They can be retrofitted simply and quickly onto existing bulk and tankers. Um, they are, we, we ran a route across the Atlantic in a feasibility analysis and we demonstrated that we could save 20% fuel and greenhouse gas emissions on that route at exactly the same speed as they would be running with their rigs and, and uh, on the, exactly the same route. So there's no loss of service just about a 20, at least a 20% emission reduction. And so since we've got that work coming out of COP26, we began um, to develop the design that we built in our um, feasibility analysis. We are now building the wings. Um, there is aluminium in production. The, the, that thing in the middle, that's a, that's a, that's a big uh, ram for lifting the, ring, the wings. So on COP28 Transport Day, we will be revealing the test fast rig in Scotland, just down the road from where we um, announced it at COP28. So my point is that we can make, we can move faster if we think beyond just fuels. So the, the next stage in our development is that we're going to be installing our rigs on this particular ship. It is a nuclear waste transporter. It has the highest safety and technical requirements of any ship that um, we might want to experience. And that helps us overcome some barriers with adoption that we experience with ship owners who want to know that we've, we've, we've power, where safety is paramount, that we, we've done this before. So in the same, to Selena's point about first movers, we need to be able to give the market confidence so we've started work on this ship already and we'll be installing a rig on it next year to, to demonstrate that technology. So my point being, my plea being, is that when we think about emission reduction, we must be doing it in line with climate science. And we should be thinking about green fuel and wind in all sorts of cases beyond just the, the container and liner route. Because the, the, the switch is, is, is to green fuels is costly and expensive and slower than we can do with wind on some of some of the the, the, the bulkers and tankers and department for transport analysis shows there are about forty thousand ships in the global fleet that could use wind and so i think we've got a potential opportunity here to to start moving a little bit fast a bit faster by expanding our um, viewpoint to go beyond containers and to go um, beyond just green fuel. So uh, that's my pitch, that's my plea, let's think more widely. Before I go into, um, into that, I wanted to just touch on, um, I was asked to do this because our 
branding has been produced. So, so many of you may know that, that the Clyde at Glasgow COP26 was, was the home of global shipbuilding in the 1950s. Most, about half the ships in the global fleet were built on the Clyde. Um, and so we have been engaging with the local communities, with the, with the schools there, and the, the local kids created our artwork for us. And we're delighted to have them uh, do that with us because it's really important. We yeah. see this green transition as a, as a critical and important um, opportunity for the world and that we need, we're need we going to be needing the young younger generations to come through. So it's kind of a recruitment program. And I wanted to just close with, um, we, we've talked a lot about complexity. We've, we've talked a lot about how difficult all, all this is. And I want to, quote, to, to close with one of my favorite quotes from um, a woman called Mary Hegler, which is, you can either be overwhelmed by the complexity of the problem of climate change, or you can fall in love with the solutions. And I think what we're doing is falling in love with solutions and we're encouraging the young kids around to do that too and do that with us. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the subsequent conversation. Thank you, Di. Um, I really appreciate, I can see all the puzzle pieces coming together. You know, there's, there's a lot of pieces to this and um, it's great to see among all the speakers today, the different different perspectives and different ways that you're addressing green shipping corridors. Um, so thank you each so much for those fantastic presentations. I think we got a lot of um, great solid understanding of what green shipping corridors are, as well as some more specific information about specific challenges and um, sectoral approaches. So thank you so much. Um, we are gonna spend about 15 minutes on Q&A um, from the audience and we have quite a few. Um, so I'm gonna start with, I think I'll pose a couple of technical questions to each of you um, and then a couple of cross-cutting questions. Um, but I just wanna say, feel free to jump in too. This is conversational. So um, if you have an idea or a comment to make, please do, do so. I think to start, um, I'll start with a question for Selena. This one came up a couple of times. So what role does COSEV see reduced speeds playing in green shipping corridors for achieving emissions reductions in the near term? And does COSEV generally support existing speed reduction efforts? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, yes, we do. I think we see things like reduced speeds and other efficiency measures as a critical sort of best practice and, and movement in the space to make sure that the vessels that are operating are doing so as efficiently as possible. And, you know, many of those efficiency measures are generally lower cost than actually transitioning to zero emission vessels. So in, especially in the short term, as that market is still being developed, those are absolutely important things that we support. We just don't believe that efficiency measures are going to be enough to get us all the way to zero emission. And so they're an important step and best practice. And, you know, there are IMO regulations around um, that are sort of helping drive those efficiency decisions. Um, and we see a role for them in the future. But we also, you know, our vision is really on focusing on getting the broad sort of the long term zero emission scalable pathway. So we're really focused on that long term vision and sort of that market kickstart but we totally recognize that efficiency is an important um, step in, on that path. I don't know if other folks want to jump into on that one. I, I mean, I think speed is really, really important and not not given enough focus. We can, if if we reduce speed now, we can we can, and and I think there's often a a pushback which says we're going to need more cargo space if we go slower or. Um, we won't be able to deliver just in time. But I think there's a lot there's, there's emerging evidence that says. Um, with smarter route optimization, with smarter route management, we will be able to um, maintain a an efficient delivery service. So I think speed is speed optimization is really important. If you combine speed optimization on those um, bulker ships that I was talking about with wind, then you get even more fuel saving, greenhouse gas emission savings benefits, and you get therefore you get a better economic proposition out of it. So yeah, absolutely. Reduce speed and do it now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and 
one thing I find interesting is um, ports who are incentivizing that as well. I know Port of Los Angeles has a, has a kind of slow speed incentive for their for the shipping industry. A lot of it's focused on emissions reductions. However, I mean that all that is a complement to all the other benefits as well from a kind of an aspiration of just in time shipping that I know a lot of my colleagues at ABS from the digital side of things see that as a the long-term goal for the broader industry is getting to a kind of just-in-time um, logistics and supply chain sort of scale, which is, you know, again, it's it's complicated, but it's certainly, it's a really fascinating and great way to, to look at it. And actually just one final note there, that Kirk reminded me that a number of the green shipping quarters that have been announced are both focused on the green part and also have a, a digital component. So um, in fact, some of them are, are mostly digital and there's not actually a lot of freight being moved on those corridors, but they're focusing on just this kind of issue. What are the sort of route optimization tools that can be employed to increase the efficiency of, um, of the freight that is moving? And, and it's very interrelated with um, the way that ports are working on decarbonizing and, and their optimization work too. So there's, there's a lot to be improved across both on the green side and on the on the digital side. Thank you. Um, love to hear the different perspectives. This is an innovation exchange after all. So appreciate um, appreciate your you know willing to give your opinion and perspective. Um, I think I'll move to this is a question from uh, for Kirk from John Andrea Monarini and. Um, Kirk, I don't necessarily have enough background to know exactly what this is, means, but um, can the Green Shipping Corridor's definition accommodate new digital services for weather routing? Absolutely. And in, okay. Kind of going back to uh, uh, optimizing routing and for the industry, um, weather data, you know, is obviously plays a critical role in the decision making process for route optimization. And actually, ABS has worked with. Uh, a buoy development company called SoFar Ocean, who is you know widely known across the world, deploying weather radar weather buoys to in order to facilitate a broader, uh, I guess, data warehouse to for better emit for better way weather monitoring data for the oceans and for optimizing routes on the shipping uh, in the shipping industry. And ABS is not alone in doing this. There are a lot of route optimization kind of software companies that are developing and starting up looking for the best way best approaches to doing that so yes absolutely that is a critical aspect of of all these route optimization opportunities and just for for someone who maybe doesn't know um can you quickly say what is weather routing so weather routing would just be understanding or getting very local and accurate weather data, which also would affect the ocean, you know, the waves and the, the currents and everything around it to find the quickest route either through or around some sort of storm yes. in the middle of the ocean. So it's just finding the fastest route or the most, maybe not the fastest route is not the correct um, statement, but the most efficient route across the ocean. Route. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I know there's so much happening in the digital space. So that was a great question. Thank you for that. Um, a question for Dai. Oh, so, Dai, go so, ahead. Uh, Sorry, I missed your hand. No, it's okay. I just wanted to say um, that we also develop, a, uh, we're developing a wind weather routing solution that, that sits on top of the, the, the uh, fast rig. It's called fast route. And we're seeing by route optimizing with wind. So you're deviating slightly off the great circle route, a 50% uplift in the fuel and greenhouse gas emission savings. Um, and there's some really cool things you can do with it. So weather routing, speed optimization and wind can have a really big impact. Thank you, Dai. Um, so my next question for you was, how can startups developing decarbonizing solutions interact with green shipping corridors? I think that's a great question. Yeah, and it's a really, really interesting one. It's very difficult for startups to be able to engage with these bigger organizations. That are, and so, you know, it's why well, it's wonderful of you to invite me to, to participate in this, because um, 
and it, you know, there's by no means any sense of criticism, but there is there is a business as usual, and we are creating something which is um, slightly unusual. I mean, when I launched earlier to telephones, they were slightly unusual, and people said that you know that would never work. We've got this mobile phone, we've got a desk phone, we you know, and it and it did. And um, when I started working onshore wind, people said that you know wind wouldn't ever provide energy, and it does. And I think. Um, it's a it's a it's a difficult arena, but I think it's about relationships. I think all of this challenge about about decarbonisation, about shifting the world, uh, is is about building relationships. So I have no judgment about anybody, and I want to um, engage and talk to as many people as I possibly can to understand their perspectives and so that they would understand ours as well. So I think that that it it, it is a challenge, um, but uh, I would say my advice was if you're a green startup and you want to engage with green corridors, then um, do your research and reach out to people because people are really, really great. They've always been tremendously helpful to us. Thank you. Any comments on that from other speakers? Uh, yeah, sure. Actually, um, I know engaging in the ocean kind of ecosystem for startups is is a is, is I wouldn't say it's new, but it's certainly of growing interest. I know National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration has an open solicitation currently for the development of of kind of ocean of an ocean accelerator program, kind of national ocean accelerators. So there there's growing interest, um, and and kind of as Di mentioned, a lot of the time it just takes that relationship building and can really reach out to organizations that are participating or that are looking and scaling kind of ocean startups. Uh, ABS is, can be very involved in certain situations depending on the technology readiness level of the startup, but uh, we're it's a, a very growing area of, of interest for the maritime industry to find kind of innovative solutions to their to the industry, certainly. I also would just add, I think um, one of the, something that we've heard in the last two years as these quarter projects have been getting set up is, is a little bit, I think, of impatience about when are they gonna start? When are they gonna hit the water? So I think it, insofar as startups with, with creative ideas and opportunities to, to pilot demonstration projects that could be deployed on one of these routes potentially and sort of be a, a sort of first um, igniter of showing what certain technologies could look like on the water. I think that's that could be something where there's a lot of appetite to sort of show progress in the short term as the intense work to, to wrangle all the data and figure out what the goals are. And, you know, it, green shipping quarters are a more sort of bite-sized version of decarbonizing the sector, but they're still a tall order. And so I think there is also opportunity for some of that um, innovative work in the short term to help kind of show momentum and leverage the energy that folks who are engaging in these quarter initiatives have to, to demonstrate value, especially in the short term window, since there are these sort of key policy windows in the next couple of years where um, some evidence can be helpful in making sure the IMO continues to move with ambition. Wonderful. Thank you all. Um, so I just have one last question for Selena, and then I will ask um, a final sort of closing question to everyone. Um, Selena, we got a couple of questions about how willing and open cargo owners are to participating um, in implementing green shipping practices, and are you experiencing any challenges with persuading them to, to participate, if you could talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, this, this is also a really good question. Sort of one of the fundamental challenges as we were getting COSEV set up is that maritime freight tends to be a very small percentage of many cargo owners overall emissions portfolios and you know there's a reason why maritime is has been called a hard to abate sector there are many sort of lower hanging fruit and that was why in the work that we did in designing zemba we really wanted to create an, an actionable opportunity for cargo owners to really kickstart that market and help solve that chicken egg problem that i was referencing because they they've sort of many of them that are leading have sort of picked the the low hanging fruit and have lots of plans in place for decarbonizing the other parts of their logistics chains and they're sort of left with these these difficult more difficult to abate sectors aviation maritime um 
So I think I think I saw a question about specifically book and claim, um, which I think that's that has been an area where we have had to um, do some convincing for car owners because, as I mentioned, fundamentally what they want is to move their they they want to move their freight on zero emission vessels, and that is ultimately the goal. You know, the hope is that shipping eventually is zero emission shipping. There is no more fossil shipping, and that's where we'll get. Um, but I think the element that has helped some car owners who who really want to move that direction right away, be more comfortable with book and claim is to um, help elevate the importance that that mechanism can have in, in aggregating demand and therefore bringing down the cost of the green premium. Any individual cargo owner going out to the marketplace and trying to solicit um, an engagement directly with a, a carrier, there's no competition there. And so they're sort of at the whim of what the the price would be in that individual relationship. And so through booking claim, we can take the collective um, the collective ambition and, and demand amongst a lot of cargo owners who may or may not all be operating in the same geography and leverage that to help drive the price down and kickstart the market. And so that has been, you know, there's been many, many discussions about book and claim, and I'm certainly not an expert in that practice. Um, my colleagues probably know more than me about that. Um, but that I think has been something that has been helpful in helping get cargo owners engaged in Zemba is that demand aggregation and sort of collective voice proposition um, makes sense for their business case. And that's fundamentally how a lot of their decisions are driven. Okay, thank you. Um, so we just have like 90 seconds, I would say to answer this question among everyone. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and, and pose it. So if you could keep your answer pretty brief, but what venues exist or are needed for the sharing of lessons learned across green shipping corridors? A really simple question with a difficult answer. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think, well, I, I want to think it's got to be the IMO because mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's the global regulator for the shipping industry. Um, and I think there's lots of opportunity for sharing information. There is already information being shared through IMO. Thank you. And I'll, I'll go next. Um, I guess from how we engage in a lot of these green shipping corridors, I think best place where we have kind of developed lessons learned or at least shared lessons learned is through kind of these broader organizations and initiatives. I, I, I mentioned Blue Sky Maritime Coalition as an example. Um, we have regular, the regular kind of workshops and sessions to, that people can just come to the table with any issues or questions about these sorts of opportunities. And that's that's been a really helpful place for me and for our organization to participate in these broader stakeholder groups. Um, but as, as Di mentioned, rolling up to like an IMO level is certainly important. Um, I think also something to be for folks to be aware of, there is significant motivation and, and momentum from Department of Energy and EPA and Marad and NOAA and uh, and Bessie Boehm, all these different organizations are trying to understand what the whole government approach is to these sorts of issues, which Green Shipping Corridor absolutely is, in my opinion. And there, there will be, from my perspective, it looks like there will be certainly a lot more opportunities to engage across the ind across industry uh, from a collaborative collaborative standpoint. So, I think there's just everyone just keep a lookout. I guess maybe my short way short answer to that. <laughs> And engage. Thank you. And how about Selena? Just very quickly, I know we're running out of time. Um, on top of everything that, that Di and Kirk shared, I think one other piece that's really important is there are a number of organizations that are serving this sort of convener role, many of which are engaged in multiple green shipping corridors, you know, folks like ABS and the Marist McKinney Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping, Global Maritime Forum, C40 Cities, Lloyd's Register Maritime Decarbonization Hub. So I think also sort of convening the conveners, which I know there are efforts underway to do that and share lessons learned for folks who have their fingers in a lot of these different um, initiatives it is also really important. And things like the Mission Possible platform that Kirk referenced earlier is one example of sort of tools, repositories intended to kind of compile all the resources from those various initiatives in one spot. Um, so we are excited about those and think those have a lot of potential to just help with the day-to-day -day, um, lessons learned and kind of working through issues and challenges. Great. 
Thank you so much. Um, so yes, we're at the end of the hour and um, I just wanna thank everyone for spending time to join us, both speakers and the audience to engage in this discussion. Um, apologies that we can't get to every question. We had a couple around biodiversity. Um, and if I could ask the speakers to please drop your email in the chat so that people could get in touch with you um, if you're comfortable with that um, to answer their questions. So finally, um, I would just like to mention that at the end of this meeting, a browser should, or a survey should pop up in your browser. And that survey is a quick way of hearing from you on any topics or ideas or even people, change makers that you'd like to hear more from in future webinars. Um, and to close, I'd just love to thank Courtney McGeechee, Director of the Decade Collaborative Center, as well as Millie Pitts, um, Executive Director of Ocean Exchange for contributing to the webinar, uh, Jess Keith, Communications Manager, and Sarah Mastroni, my fellow program officer for your support in running this meeting. Um, and yeah, huge thanks to everyone for tuning in and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.